So we have a vision to take the company to about a $10 billion valuation. In today's video, we're finally sitting down with Frank Holmes and Aiden Killick. We're gonna talk about Hive Blockchain's recent earnings results. We're gonna talk about Ethereum 2.0 and we're gonna talk about the company in general. I'm gonna ask management some of the most important questions that you guys have sent to me. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Once again, thank you so much for your support. Let's not be around the bush. Let's get straight into it. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me. I really appreciate that. It's great to be with you. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks for having us, Alex. It's my pleasure. So you guys had an absolutely incredible earnings. I would love if you guys would just give us a brief summary of what high blockchain achieved over the past couple of months. It's been honestly, it's probably one of the best reports that we've seen from a crypto miner in a very, very long time. So congratulations on that. Well, thank you. And thank you for your faith and confidence in our vision. Uh, I know that it was really frustrating, disappointing, disheartening, and knowing uh, that uh, our financials took so long. Uh, and, we, and we had that uh, for because we're in multi jurisdictions and, and uh, most of our peers are only in one country. Uh, and, and I think that we've resolved all that going forward uh, with new procedures and disciplines and hiring more people. But I, I think outside of that, we kept telling people that um, in our press releases, which we're allowed to say that. Um, things are going well, and anyone that downloads our hashing power, et cetera, can create a simple model that allows you to have the confidence that we're, we're doing exceptionally well. Uh, but what we do find, Ali, is that there's this whole audience out there that if it's, if it can only be Bitcoin mining, and then when you go to the crypto space, that it can only be a dog, a doggy, doji, this. And, you know, it, it's interesting to see such diehards for me um, that have a very narrow view of looking at the crypto space, uh, we, we believe that there's two parts to crypto. We believe that Ethereum is critical, like Bank of America and J.B. Morgan believe, that, um, that it's so critical for the backbone of the blockchain is really Ethereum, smart contracts, the DeFi, uh, and to now NFTs. And that's why we've made many strategic investments. Rather than try to build and hire a lot of people, we'd rather bet, bet and by investing in other great entrepreneurs. But we've been able to deliver it because we mine both Bitcoin and Ethereum, and our Ethereum has the highest grossing margins to any Bitcoin miner. And one, one thing, Ali, that's a good reference point right now, and it fluctuates slightly with time, but every terahash of Ethereum mining is equal to about 200 petahash of Bitcoin mining, right? Yep. So... If Hyde has 4.2 terahash of Ethereum mining, that's almost an extra 900 petahash of Bitcoin mining. Wow. Right? So that's on top of our current active footprint of 1.25. It's actually 1.26, but you get it. So it puts us, and I covered this in the earnings call. So our current active equivalent Bitcoin hash rate is about two point, um, it's, it's over two exahash, you know? And that's, that's how we're putting $52 million in revenue on the board. In this quarter, uh, higher than all of our peers, right? And I think it's our, our duty to do the more difficult math and present it for the investing public to realize how you can um, correlate Ethereum and Bitcoin mining, just to add on to what Frank said. 100%. And I think that a lot of times, like when we talk about uh, like exahash or hash rates, it just uh, it's a figure that a lot of people really don't understand. So like, if you were to break it down on a daily basis, what does that actually translate to in terms of cash? Because people understand what cash is on a daily basis. So what does that generate you guys on a daily, weekly, or a monthly basis right now? So currently, our Ethereum operations generates upwards of $300,000 US a day in revenue. Wow. It's plus $300,000 a day. And the US. Bitcoin is growing. It, uh, so at $60,000, it's throwing off... Uh, over 400 Over 400 Yeah. So you and, have them together. Uh, and we're being conservative. We're rounding down, obviously. But you could say $700,000 US dollars a day in, in revenue from our collective operations. And in host, and, and also holding uh, Ethereum with all these naysayers, you know, Ethereum was up three times Bitcoin the past year. So mining, holding, mining and holding it has been a great win for our shareholders. 100%. And, uh, and just to remind everyone that's watching this video right now, based on their previous quarter, they reported 52.6 million dollars USD and that's revenue from digital mining. That is one of the best in the sector period, like historically. So if there's ever any doubt about the company generating an insane amount of revenue, I mean, like the numbers are there uh, in stone for you guys. So that's incredible. What's also really essential too is the margin. So you guys are clearly, uh, it's like your break even price 
on whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin is incredibly low. It looks like your gross mining margin is 86%. Exactly. And, and that's, that's the thing. We've also taken the high road in the sense that that's all renewable energy, right? This, is, this, isn't, this isn't two cent coal power in New York. This is yeah. green and clean hydro and geothermal in Canada and the Nordic countries, right? And that's been the story from Hive since day one is the first public crypto miner which started it all. 100%. And, and we get a it's sort of, it's, it's disappointing, but you see some people get up and speaking and have a picture in the background with a bunch of wind farms and, uh, <laughs> might be, you know, 1% of their, of their energy, but they're, oh, I look, you know, form over substance and the other one was solar panels in the back. Uh, we're, we're very dedicated to being clean, clean and green. And those coins, we just believe, uh, we've been offered more for our Bitcoins because they come from green and clean. Uh, some people get really upset about that. The Bitcoin world is all fungible. Everything should be the same. But I disagree because I think that they're going to become like Andy Warhol art. You have original prints of Andy Warhol. They've gone up substantially. You have an original Babe Ruth baseball fanatic. You know, those cards, if you have un, un, undamaged, they go up in value. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled about our strategy. Uh, and I'm also thrilled that uh, in the U.S. it doesn't seem to have gotten caught in awe. It's sort of captured uh, institutions yet, but it's very significant in Europe, in Singapore, um, and where we other places we've been invited because we have a very green and clean strategy. 100%. And that's something I'm sure that you've heard, uh, like Kevin O'Leary talked about this, and you've talked about this too, that there's going to be a huge uh, demand, especially with this whole ESG trend going on right now where a lot of these coins are coming from. So you can trace where these coins are coming from. You can tell if it's coming from uh, a place that's generated from coal energy or something that's uh, like wind like energy and so forth, correct? Correct. That's awesome. Uh, and, and so it, we, we, like we know where we source our electricity uh, and, uh, and I think that that's what's really the key part. So, and we also then have done uh, leaders in using software to partner with the local community in Bowdoin uh, with the utility company so that there's a spike in demand uh, that they pay us to basically cut back in the morning and the afternoon uh, when people have a big energy demand. It's a lot less expensive for them from a capital point of view and a management because we can tool down 20, 20 megawatts that's going to 30 very quickly. I'm talking seconds and tool up uh, in, in a minute. They would take 15 minutes to a half hour to tool up. So they would have to have a huge backup support for these communities where using our software, we actually help the community uh, and facilitate. And, and so I, I think it's just a, a wonderful what we've been able to do. And then when you're a place like Sweden, the love is hockey. I mean, everything is hockey. It, it, it really is so interesting. We think of Canadians with hockey. They have pro circuits, like in every town in Nova Scotia and every town in New Brunswick, they would all be competing with each other. And, it, and, and on Saturday night and Wednesday night, it like dominates all the kids go to the hockey arena. Uh, so we're very much in, in, the, in the Bowdoin sponsoring for education for kids, uh, not to be in the streets. They go to the hockey game. We have a, our own beehive corner. Uh, so they, they like us because we, we really are caught up with the community. That's awesome. And something I actually wanted to touch on, we, uh, Aiden, we talked about this very briefly last time. But even when it comes to your facility in New Brunswick, like you guys really focus on hiring people that are local to the area. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. We uh, recently made an addition to our team. He's a, he's a local guy who grew up in the community and he's our regional director now for all of our New Brunswick operations. And he's been overseeing uh, the operation of that facility since, since day one, because when you, when you're going, you've got 70 megawatts operating, which we're going to have in a few months here, you know, this is, this is a major data center campus and, you know, everything from, you know, IT specialists, people who repair the miners, people who are ha helping with, uh, you know, day-to-day -day issues in terms of ensuring that you've got constant movement of air, uh, ensuring the filters are clean, racking miners when new shipments come in. This, there's a lot of, there's a there's manual labor. And so we hire from the local talent pool, right? We're all about, we've got a great late relationship with the mayor as well. So Frank believes very heavily in investing in the communities where we do business. It's part of our footprint. And something I actually really want to talk about is an update on the facility in New Brunswick for a lot of people that aren't familiar. You guys are building a huge facility that you guys are actually going to own, correct? Correct. We own it. And I'm sure with you, Ollie, was, when we first made the decision, what we noticed is that landlords get very greedy when Bitcoin's going up. Uh, <laughs> extremely difficult. And, uh, and vice versa, they forget your name when it's falling and your cash flow is falling. So we went through the economics and we believe that in the long-term vision, now with the metaverse coming on, Data centers are going to become very valuable. 
and an expertise in GPUs are going to make it even you more valuable. Uh, and so let's go and control our destiny by owning the land, owning the building, partnering with the local community and the local utility company. And when we went to do that, it was less than $350,000 a megawatt. And then out of nowhere, Riot turned around and paid $2 million a megawatt to be in Austin, Texas. Uh, they don't have our cool weather. They'll have other uh, issues, but they are very big in our community and they're very important in Texas now, but they made 2 million. So if you think of us having 50 megawatts, you know, what we've done there, that's a $100 million valuation on that asset US dollars. So you've got to look back and say, well, what did it cost us? It cost us 25 million to build it out with some shares. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a great long-term asset for the shareholders. It's right beside the border of Maine, and therefore you can easily down the road be doing rendering or any type of uh, uh, data AI work, et cetera, from those machines. We can turn around and reposition the machines. So we think that if Ethereum was to go to proof of stake, and it was all of a sudden really to hurt this business, we have the capacity to pivot. I'm very happy that you brought that up. So that's probably the biggest question that I get. Okay, so as soon as, soon as that transition happens from to proof of work to proof of stake, that's it. It's, uh, it's basically game over for Hive. Now you guys do have an HPC strategy in place, uh, a high performance computing strategy in place. Could you give people, obviously like, don't give us a very detailed or very, uh, you know, uh, like a complicated explanation, but in very simple terms, like what does that mean? Like what is this whole strategy, the HPC strategy? So let's take a look at in Sweden. Our, our 580 uh, AMD chips, they make about $2 a day. Yep. And if we went and allowed those to be used for artificial intelligence, for research you need to do, regressional studies, uh, a hospital doing cancer research, they send them the data, they have to go through and use us, these GPU chips, you make about $2 an hour. That's the difference. Oh, okay. Now, you have a sales force along with it and service, et cetera, that goes with it but you make much more. And, and one of the things is that you can see is that um, Amazon makes all the profits from the cloud and selling these cloud services. And if you look at what they charge for the quality of the chip, uh, we could come in 30% cheaper, 40%, 50% cheaper, and still make more than we make in mining Ethereum. So we, we like the idea of mining all these, with the NVIDIA chips we have, and getting our big capex as fast as, as possible back so we can generate that high cash flow return on invested capital uh, and then build out our HPC. Um, but at the same time, we want to relate to is that we see that uh, some of our peers you know, are now started mining Ethereum to get Bitcoin. Uh, and they say they mine for $3,000 their Bitcoin. Uh, Aiden, what do we, what's our cost? 1,700 if we sold it to buy? Exactly. So- I, I, you know, I, I sit back and uh, don't want to argue with them. I, uh, I, I just want to go on you know, to, to run our business the best we can and build real assets on the balance sheet. We've looked at other countries of buying outright um, uh, uh, data centers. We like the idea of buying uh, the data center and, and uh, hiring our own people or subcontracting out. In Sweden, we subcontract out to a phenomenal group in Croatia. And, uh, and, and they have what? So they have 80 some odd employees, they do coding software, they do everything. And so they're helping build out our HPC, but they're also have tremendous expertise in um, GPU chips, which you need for HPC, but also for mining. And uh, and Ivan has done, uh, met with him several times. Uh, he's been up to Sweden uh, once so far since he joined us and to Iceland to see the facilities. Uh, and they're just a, a great, they're a great team for us to be able to uh, outsource to run that facility, uh, but we talk to them every morning. Yeah, and one thing that people don't realize is that we do we do an, an immense amount of technical analysis internally at Hive, um, and we work in concert with with our with our entire team. And it's one it's a it's a fine balance because you know we we don't want to broadcast all of the decisions that we're making and and why we're making those decisions. We're not going to give away our playbook. But we just choose to let the numbers speak for themselves, and they come out at the end of the quarter. And so it's all about capital allocation, knowing what chips to buy at what price. It's, it's, all, it's all like a symphony of capital allocation, right? And when you place your bets properly, you end up seeing the cash flow and that hits the books when the financials come out down the road. And of course, you know, the great uh, mining margin figures that you see. 100%. We're very conscientious now. Like we want to be as transparent as possible, but it's become very cutthroat. When we did a deal a year ago with Canon buying equipment for them and we bought someone else, Someone else immediately contacted them to pay five dollars more a terahash. So we're not going to tell you what we pay, uh, and and then all of a sudden 
these some of these providers start playing games of well, we can't deliver your machines. Would you like to break the order? Because because now they can get sixty five dollars a terahash. Uh, so we've got to become very very cautious. We had uh, first it was a Chinese group we were told, then it's another group that showed up in in uh, uh, New Brunswick uh, trying to buy land right beside where we are to mine with us because they saw the facility. Uh, guys had chutzpah to call up and say, uh, let's say they'll see what you have. Well, why would we do that? <laughs> you know, and, and, and so it, it is very like like hockey night in Canada. Uh, you keep your head down and you get knocked out. Uh, and and so we've seen it from when we do a webcast, people coming in with fun statements, we try to be disruptive. We've seen it from on our Twitter that we'll make some statement and, and people come in and make like foolish statements. And like I said earlier to you, I'm sure that they don't have a number really. They, they don't have followers. Someone's paying for these bots to go out and be like cyber hornets to create this information. Uh, and, and so we would just like, keep our head up, stay focused on what we're building and, and creating wealth for shareholders. 100%. And since we're on that topic, like just to be very clear to, you know, uh, so we're on record and for everyone that's watching this video, are you guys paying me to do this interview? Am I being compensated to speak no. well about high blockchain or make like YouTube videos? No, not at all. No. And this is the first time we've ever, ever, ever communicated. Uh, and uh, no, you're definitely unequivocally not on any payroll with us, uh, but you've been a very, dedicated, focused, and, and committed analysts covering the industry, and in particular, high. And you've been very straightforward, candid, when uh, we were slow in getting financials out, you know, have just disappointed you, frustrated you, and we can relate to that. But you're always consistent. When we turn the numbers, you're consistent. So we thank you for covering our story. Awesome, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, so I have a very juicy question for you guys right now. So a lot of the people that watch the channel talk a lot about how much Ethereum that you guys have on the balance sheet right now. Is it around like 25,000 right now, just based on the most recent update? Well, based on our most recent update, it's 25,000. Um, and what we've worked on is to focus more on what our Bitcoin is, uh, because that's the scenes where the crazy valuations. I mean, some companies are still less revenue per share, less returns of best of capital, uh, and much higher GNA than us, but they trade a billion dollars worth more than us. And, and they don't have the assets that we have. So uh, I uh, think that we'll just, stay focused on what we're doing. Awesome. So the transition right now is really to move from a more Ethereum focused mining company more towards a Bitcoin mining company and it's more of a Bitcoin, the codeling company, correct? You're going to see us become a much bigger and more significant Bitcoin holder uh, of coins. And, uh, and that's what's been growing steadily. Um, and so we have it mapped out. Uh, you just hopefully everything comes on as you know, the weather in the East Coast at this time of year can be very volatile, just like crypto prices are. <laughs> but uh, we get the facility up by Christmas uh, and we'll be able to lock in our other machines. So we're all ready to plug them in. They'll give us another exa hash uh, and then to push for the next building to by March. Uh, we're adding and expanding. It's what uh, I need 10 megawatts in Sweden. Yeah. So we've got an operating footprint right now of 88 megawatts. And by the end of Q1 2022, we'll be at 138 megawatts operating wow. green and clean. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. Like, you know, I, I start providing these these summaries here because I is sophisticated with global. We've got operations all over the place, and we know that the investing public they might be following five or six crypto mining stories. So we're going to start compartmentalizing it. Here it is. You know what? We've got our 2022. We're going to be at three exahash of pure Bitcoin mining. In addition to that, six terahash of Ethereum mining. If you convert that Ethereum mining right to Bitcoin, it, it's an extra 1.2 exahash. Oh, sorry, yes, an extra 1.2 exahash. You add that up. That's uh, you're at 4.2 exahash of equivalent Bitcoin mining. In addition to that, in addition to that, we just announced a hundred million dollar convertible note. That, that allows us the capital to add another exahash on top of that. So that puts our 2022 number to 5.2 exahash, right? And so I want to start summarizing it so the investing public can be like, well, hold on. If Hyde is already doing 52 million dollars in revenue in one quarter, and they've got an active footprint today of you know. Uh, 1.2, uh, 1.25 exahash and, and the Ethereum of 4.2 terahash, they could take that and then they can extrapolate and realize where we'll be. And one other point I'm going to add to that is if there's a company that's new, you just raised a bunch of money, they said, okay, we're going to go buy a bunch of miners. They're going to have to either develop their own infrastructure, which most companies are not doing. They're just going to go host somewhere else. And so now they've got counterparty risk. They still got execution risk and they still got to plug all of these things in. These things in. I've been operating since 2017 through two crypto bear markets, right? So I think that 
there needs to be uh, awareness and, and a, a credit evaluation applied to companies that have demonstrated operational excellence over the years versus just a new upstart that's like, hey, guess what? I just ordered 10,000 machines and they're gonna be online in two years. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of what ifs in that scenario, right? There's no what ifs when you see $52 million on the, on the revenue for one quarter. Yeah, like I, I, it's just, uh, it's very frustrating to me too as an investor, and I'm sure like to you guys as well, like these results have been incredible, but the market just doesn't seem to be responding to this. Now we talk, uh, Frank, we were talking about uh, like people just, you know, the Bitcoin mining is the buzzword and there's just not a love, that's, there's not a lot of love when it comes to the Ethereum portion, right? And, and we even saw a, a clock sheet that had that we were not expensive and they excluded our Ethereum profits. Like I'm serious, it's a brokerage firm. And, and, and you know, you go, wow. But we recently did a financing because the ability to go through the BC Securities Commission to maintain the shelf's prospectus, that just takes a lot of time. And we say, you know, we want to be able to get another exit hash in the books now, uh, tie things up. And it was well oversubscribed. There was $320 million wanted. Um, we capped it for only $100 million in, in change with it. And, um, and we did it at a penny premium. I, and other people did it at a you know, 15% discount and they still had a warrant at a higher price. So uh, I, I thought that we did well. Um, it was only in Canada. Um, the only difficulty some of the hedge funds in Canada that were able to get some. They're such, you know, they talk on both sides of their mouth, but they were immediately shorting. Uh, I think they had to add to the pressure because they only care about a warrant. The warrant's only 30 months. It's not a, a five-year warrant. Um, so I, 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 that's just their strategy. But really, uh, the stock has come off because we come off with Bitcoin and Ethereum. We trade by the hour. You can see the quant funds uses as a proxy coming in and out by the hour that do not go on to an encrypted exchange. Uh, and so we think that that's you know, most interesting how it's evolved. But I, I think when we look at where, where Hive is in this, we brought in the Bank of Montreal. It's the first big bank in Canada participated in the Hive funding. You know, this is institutional class and we had over a hundred shareholders. We had one client call up and you know, upset because, and wasn't another broker upset with me because they had one client for a hundred million dollars. I said, no, we want broad distribution in our story uh, that believe in the vision. Hedge funds do not believe, they only believe in sell the shares, get the warrant, and that's, that's their business model. So uh, we were delighted because I know these other fundings, very few people can bring in a hundred new shareholders. Like hopefully, Frank, it's like you can as a comment on this. I think a lot of people they kind of like misunderstand the whole purpose of having a stock is to raise funds. So even though it may seem like dilution, at the end of the day, that fund, that capital is putting towards further expansion, correct? Sure. And and, and it's immediate. Like if we buy the equipment and plug it in immediately, we buy the price of six months payback. So if we have to wait five months to get the equipment, then we're talking about that month payback in our capital. And in a rising trend, it could be three months that you get your money back. Um, uh, so no doubt, and unless we, we are seeing opportunities because of our strong ESG strategy so far, we've been invited to go into various communities. Uh, and so we think that we'll continue to be green and clean. There was another big funding of an Australian group that came out this week, um, and they immediately came off, it was too bad, and it was, but they don't hold it, they sell all their coins, and their vision would be green coins only, uh, with, I believe, wind, and uh, they're up in British Columbia. But I, I, I think it's, you know, interesting that there's no other company that is just pure green and clean the way we are and focus on that and holding the coins. So if the exchanges do not allow the regulators a ETF where you can buy physical Bitcoin, then what happens is that we become that proxy. As, as we grow, we become that proxy. 100%. A question that I've been getting a ton of, uh, like Adam, like this is probably gonna be like more pertaining to you because I know that you love talking about numbers. If people just can't uh, appreciate if Ethereum is making that transition, how is it possible for the mining of Ethereum to still stay like profitable? Could you explain in very simple terms why you guys are still able to, to remain profitable, even with the London hard fork and EIP 1559 and so forth? Yeah, definitely. So I think the easiest way for the investing public to understand this is think about the dollars per giga hash that you earn on a daily basis, right? And so if you do that, it's really easy to extrapolate. You go, well, Hive has 4,200 giga hash active, which is the same as 4.2 tera hash, by the way, right? Yep. It's a thousand of another. And so if right now it's about 75 bucks tera hash, right? And we've caught 4,200 giga hash. What's that? It's over 300,000. And what did we, we tell you at the beginning of the interview? We're making over 300 grand a day. 
Now, this is this is but you, you can go to bid info charts. Just, if you literally just Google um, bid info charts is a good public, uh, you know, crypto mining calculator website. Uh, let's see if you Google ETH per gigahash per day. There, there's charts. We put them in our MDNA. Yep. And, uh, and in fact, if you refer to our MDNA and we put it in our uh, earnings call. Uh, in fact, if you just want to flip to the earnings call at your leisure, if anyone's reading this or watching this YouTube video after this. Uh, it's on page 12, uh, I think. Uh, page 31 and page 32 of our report. It shows you the respective dollar per terahash per day for Bitcoin mining and dollar per giga, uh, giga hash per day for Ethereum mining. And what you'll notice is uh, really since June, um, we've been riding a very constant level uh, for Ethereum net. Uh, profits. And so that's a network wide uh, figure. And so even though the difficulties tripled in the last year, Ethereum has gone up substantially uh, in price, right? And so that's, that's kind of, it's, it's basically the price action in Ethereum that's offsetting the difficulty. And uh, Frank might have alluded to this earlier. We think that people are inherently staking more Ethereum now because they think that there's going to be this proof of stake that's, whether it's in six months or two years, no one can say for certain. Um, and so with more staking, there's less supply in circulation. And so you see that the price escalating, right? And by the way, we've got a, a, you know, a huge treasury of Ethereum. Um, so it increases our mark to market. So that's all gravy for us anyways. I think the other part of we do in the slideshow is explain to people that our daily production went from 300 coins to 80. And yeah. is it because of the forks in London fog? No, London fog, not frog. No, come on, stop all this stuff. And all these words are just negative, negative, negative. It is so many gamers have turned on their machines to mine Ethereum when they sleep. And we know this because when China did the crackdown, the difficulty of Bitcoin have, but not with Ethereum. And then Ethereum went to a new time high of mining difficulty. So we have seen in the past year the difficulty that is, it's a fixed amount every 20 seconds to mine uh, that's out there that in that fixed, the fixed number. Um, there's more and more people looking for that piece of a pie. So therefore it's more difficult. And, and we've had in the past year, a tremendous amount of coins come out of the supply to go to your yield with all the new DeFi products and all the other, uh, now they're doing NFT products and stable coins. They've basically taken Ethereum supply side out. I know if you take a supply or lemon supply and demand grows, that's going to go exponentially. Yeah. So what's really happened to us is that the price has gone up tenfold. The uh, mining difficulty has gone up 350%. We're still ahead and we still make more money every month than we did a year ago. 100%. Exactly. Yeah. So what we have to do is maintain buying more machines to maintain paying off those machines as fast as possible and maintain. So our goal, we used to be 200 uh, uh, for 2%, 200 basis points off the Ethereum hashing network, and now a bit less than 1%. So we have more machines coming on stream over the next three months that'll take us back over 1%, and that maintain that sort of income. What we think there's more money for us to mine and hold our Ethereum than contribute to earn an income. So we've not done that. And, and that's been a business strategy. T touch wood, it's worked for the past year. Holding Ethereum is worth three times more than holding Bitcoin. Now, is that guaranteed for the future? No. Uh, do that over five years, they're equal. Do that over the past year, uh, Ethereum's outperformed. So we just think at this stage, it's better to do that. And we think that the difficulty is only going to continue to grow. Anecdotally, as I was at this conference and a city designer uh, comes up and tells me that uh, he uses, has a 580 or so chip and at nighttime, he leaves the machine on. And once a year, he basically gets an Ethereum and that pays for his new technology. Well, if, if you get 50,000 kids doing that, you can see why over the past 10 years, NVIDIA as a chip provider, their stock has far outperformed the Intels of the world. Yeah, yeah. That's growth. So kids can not only mine Ethereum and make a buck from it, they can go buy more technology in that ecosystem. And that's almost their metaverse. 100%. It's like, do you guys anticipate any difficulty when it comes to expansion, especially with the supply chains that we have with COVID-19, with the whole uh, inflation talk? Like, do you guys see challenges in the upcoming months when it comes to expansion, at least? Well, all of our construction's underway. We've done our procurement months and months ahead. And so when we give you a forecast and we say that New Brunswick's going to be at 50 megawatts in December, I mean, we're flying out there 
for a Christmas party with the construction crew in a couple of weeks to, uh, you know, see it all come online. So, you know, we were talking about having steel and transformers, uh, you know, months and months and months ago, right? And so when our, our next building that comes online in Q1, again, you know, the foundations laid the material. So it's that, remember earlier, Ali, when I made a point, I said, you know, if you're a new contender to the game, you raise some money, you buy some machines, yeah. and now you've got this huge runway ahead of you to execute, figure out how, where you're going to plug them in. That's what I'm talking about, right? The execution risk, right? People are going to be like, okay, well, I never realized we need a procurement specialist to help us navigate these headwinds, right? And so this is what we've been doing and doing. And so, you know, we all the machines that we have on order, you look at our announcements back to the summer. Uh, so we, we've always been trying to step, uh, think three steps ahead. And finally, guys, I, I know it's like I've had you on here for almost uh, like 40 minutes now. Um, just a final question very quickly. Is what can you, so what can investors expect from Hive Blockchain over the next year or two at least? Is there anything exciting in the works that you could tell us? Probably it's like you can't tell us, but uh, is there anything that we could look forward to in the upcoming like, year or two? Well, I, I think that uh, we're very conscious of cost of energy. Uh, we mine in Sweden for three cents now. <laughs> That's crazy. Right. Uh, no, one, no one's coming close to that. Um, I, I think that so we'll maintain, we have a discipline of cash flow returns on invested capital. Uh, we do not want to hire tons and tons of people. We want to be like a royalty company. So at that June year end, uh, quarter end, that gives us a run rate of $10 million per employee. Goldman Sachs is a million. We're 10 million. We're a pretty good company. Uh, and and uh, our, our goal is to take that up so that my vision is to take it to $25 million of revenue per employee. Uh, and then you have a company like a Franco Nevada trades. Uh, and we have intellectual capital uh, at the level. If you take a look at the team we have that I just built uh, with Bill, Bill Gray in, in Quebec, right? So we have... Uh, uh, systems experts, um, go ahead, I tell us, tell us about your electrical engineer. Yeah, I mean, you know, I talked about how we do a lot of analysis. Our guys run the gamut. I mean, whether it's, you know, pure mathematics, whether it's, you know, um, you know software integration, you know, understanding hash rate economics, electrical engineering, uh, remote management of systems, just pulling all the data together globally through the, uh, the APIs from our different facilities. We measure energy consumption. We look at hash rate, uptime. And then we look at the uh, mapping out of capital allocation, right? So we, we have models that go up to the executive level for the C-suite. And we have models that, you know, multi-page Excel spreadsheets that, you know, we, just, uh, we, we have a chat group called High Data Geeks. And it's, it's, the, it's uh, you know, it's our, our pure, pure technocrats. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, every day I look forward to working with the team. Uh, it's incredibly intelligent and bright. Uh, individuals just uh, super resilient and uh, yeah just a big shout out to Bill Gray, Luke Rossi, uh, you know phenomenal individuals, everybody else on our team, Mario, uh, they're, they're absolutely fantastic and uh, our, our team in Croatia and Sweden as well. Awesome. And then we have, we have a, a whole team of 86 Croatians uh, and a lot of them are scientists and coders etc in Croatia uh, that are also special telecom soldiers basically and uh, you know I I, I just, uh, we outsource to them. We manage it every day. We uh, have a call, State of the Union, four o'clock uh, Europe time, um, seven o'clock uh, Iden's time, um, nine o'clock mine here. Uh, and we sit down and we go for sometimes 20 minutes up to an hour. Uh, first starts about Europe, talking about what issues they're doing. Where's equipment? What is this part? Where's the new opportunity? They, they drop off. Then we come to North America and we talk about uh, business and opportunities and meetings. Uh, what happened all day long, and then now we bring in accounting comes in. So we have uh, East from Montreal running, uh, overseeing now uh, all the accounting for uh, uh, Sweden and uh, Iceland uh, and Bermuda. Uh, participates in the meeting with the CFO. So just make sure there's any issues that we have to work with. Everyone works. It's this, this really important to set the tone of the morning for here, and we know it's taking place for Europe. Uh, and to prove that tone setting for Europe, that's why we hired uh, a European and made a European person who's a, who's a Swedish to get along with the culture of the people. Uh, but she's a, a performance person. She ran the Boston Marathon in three and a half hours. That's pretty fast. Uh, and not only she was at the University of Chicago, she played D1 basketball and uh, was an All-American scholar. Uh, so she's a, a professional jock and she's got to perform. Uh, and so we've, we've done that to make sure that when we're sleeping, someone in Europe is driving that process for us. Uh, and because we've become bigger. 
So we're excited about that. But I think what you want to think is that we have a vision to take the company to about a $10 billion valuation. Um, and, and so we have to make some right choices. Uh, we will need as any, any type of investment that the wind hits our sale, that is she's in a bull cycle with uh, in particular in Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, that we know to participate in that. And we think the future for HBC, which will have a much more storytelling on that next year, will be huge. Awesome. And just a quick, uh, like something, it's a came up. I have a question here. Uh, can investors expect like dividends or for you guys to stake any of your coins at some point? Yeah, you can always think of that. But at this stage, uh, it, it, it's just smarter to take that capital yeah. because there's very few places you can make a six month return on your capital. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and, and so it's much better for us to be able to tap capital markets, deploy it. You know, most people, if, if you have a 10% rate of return on your capital, you have to wait, wait seven years to get your money back. Yeah. Uh, we, our goal is we get all our money back plus in a year. So therefore, paying dividends would be a horrible return on your investment when we could turn around and deploy it to get a much higher return on investor capital. That's awesome. And gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Do you have any questions for me? No, I think uh, all of you are doing a great job um, in what you're doing and, and keeping investors informed, uh, keeping a very balanced perspective and uh, keep up the comp sheets to understand the difference between each of us. Um, but it, it's no doubt you're in a great industry. You're riding a big volatile wave and uh, people need research that you're providing. And thank you for covering us. It's my pleasure, guys. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate that. Likewise, we appreciate it, Ali. Awesome. Always a great time talking to you. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. I'm